Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm not going to have you stand the whole session, but just to give you a break from the seats before we head into the next phase of things. While you're turning there, remember the harvest party coming up, sign-ups for that. Uh, I was talking with Pastor Bob about what's planned on that, and it sounds very, very exciting. That is a major um, outreach opportunity for our children in this church in in the year. So, um, and they of course can't put that on themselves, and so uh, it's up to us. And and so signups for that to help on that are uh, at the sign up counter. Also, be aware. I heard announced this morning uh, the puppeteer class that's coming up. Where's our puppeteer? Do we have? Is he here tonight? Okay. Well, I wouldn't. I mean. Don't be shy if you're here. I'm a big fan of puppeteers. Anyway, that class coming up on a puppeteer deal and to learn that, and I think it's great not only for the children's church and all where that's used, but I'd love people every time they turn around in Modesto to be running into Calvary Chapel puppets with a good message, you know, and so take advantage of these opportunities. I, I mean, I look at you and I know there's puppeteers out there just looking at you, you know, and, and uh, you have... A great future in it, I'm quite sure, and, and so take advantage of that. Why don't you sit back down and we'll tear into the word tonight. Hmm. It's been a while since we've been together in Jeremiah. And I think just by way of short review, in chapters 30 through 33... Um, There are a small uh, collection of prophecies within the larger context of the whole book. And, I mean, everything is just as bad as it can be for the southern kingdom of Judah. And it's, it's going to get worse because they're not going to turn away from their wickedness or their rebellion against God. So God just keeps having to turn up the heat. Um, because God always wins. If he doesn't win in this life, he wins in the next one to come. But he always wins. And he always wins among his people, those who are really his people. And so they kept rebelling and God kept turning up the heat and it was getting worse and worse in terms of the circumstances that were surrounding them. But then in the midst of this whole scene where it just looks like this is just a catastrophe, there's no hope. God is sick and tired and up to here with his people and he's done with them and and rightly so. He he comes out with four chapters of the, the most beautiful prophecies concerning the future of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. And that's what we're in the middle of. He's talking about the future that they have, the hope that they have uh, while they're in the middle of of really some dark, dark uh, circumstances. So we pick up the same theme of the future on the other side of their chastening for their rebellion in chapter 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. So that gives us the timing of of the prophecy. And here are the circumstances of the prophecy. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in uh, the king of Judah's house. And so... The Babylonians have laid siege to Jerusalem, and uh, and not only is Jeremiah ostracized by his people, but now Zedekiah the king has kind of put him in a prison within it, the court of his of Zedekiah's house. And here's the reason in verse three: for Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up in the prison, uh, really trying to shut him up, saying, "Why do you prophesy and say?" Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city, Jerusalem, into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And then he, Nebuchadnezzar, shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, And there Zedekiah shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, you shall not succeed. So you can imagine how um, great uh, Jeremiah's message was going over. It is the final 
really weeks and months before they're going to fall to the Babylonians. It's like every man with an ounce of strength is on the walls to fight against the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is going through the streets and saying, you might as well give up. This city is going to be taken over by the Babylonians. And no matter what the king says to you, the king is going to see the king of Babylon face to face, eye to eye, and then he's going to be taken to Babylon. There's no hope. If the king isn't going to escape, then you non-king people aren't, aren't going to escape this thing either. And, and so uh, you, you can imagine how demoralizing that was as a message from Zedekiah, King Zedekiah's vantage point. And, as we'll see in later chapters, the message of Jeremiah was viewed as treason against his people. It was the truth. It was going to happen. They ought to have done what Jeremiah was prophesying. But they considered it to be treason and taking away the morale uh, among among the people. And so he was in prison to try and uh, quiet him up. But that's very, very difficult to do with with God's prophets and, and with the Lord. Verses 4 and 5 are, are uh, extraordinarily interesting verses because... Uh, God, through Jeremiah, gives King Zedekiah prophecy. And he tells Zedekiah that he is not going to escape the hands of the the Babylonians, of the Chaldeans, which is the same. But he's going to be captured by the king of Babylon. He's going to speak to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, face to face. He's going to look him eye to eye. And then Nebuchadnezzar is going to lead Zedekiah to Babylon. And, and so here's, God is stating that King Zedekiah is going to see the king of Babylon, that King Zedekiah is going to be taken to Babylon as a captive. Now, while Jeremiah is prophesying in Jerusalem, another prophet by the name of Ezekiel is prophesying for God in Babylon to God's people. And in Babylon, at the same time that Jeremiah is saying these things to Zedekiah in Jerusalem. Ezekiel in Babylon is stating that King Zedekiah will not see Babylon. And when King Zedekiah heard both of these prophecies, that he would be taken captive by the Babylonians, by Jeremiah, and taken to Babylon, and yet Ezekiel was saying that he wouldn't see Babylon He considered the prophecies to be contrary, and so he rejected both of them. He rejected both prophecies. Now, the interesting thing is is that God knew that even though on the surface they appeared to be contradictory, that they were both going to come to pass. And here's how they came to pass. When at the last moment it became apparent that Jerusalem was not going to be held by the Jews, King Zedekiah and his family tried to make their way out of the city through a secret tunnel. When the Babylonians broke through into the city, they discovered that the king had escaped with his family. This was very common. And so they then sent a force out to now find the king and his family. They weren't going to let the king get away. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is steaming at this point. This is the third time he's had to take this city. And his forces catch up with Zedekiah, fleeing with his family. They capture King Zedekiah, hold him out in the plain, Nebuchadnezzar comes out to King Zedekiah, and King Zedekiah sees the king of Babylon face to face. They look at one another eye to eye, and then Nebuchadnezzar killed King Zedekiah's sons in front of his very eyes. This was very common in ancient warfare. And then having killed his sons in front of his eyes, he then had King Zedekiah's eyes gouged out of his head so that the final thing that he would have ever seen with his eyes was the death of his children. They played for keeps. This was very serious business. Then and now warfare is. And so the two prophecies were perfectly fulfilled in what happened. He saw Nebuchadnezzar face to face, eye to eye. He was taken to Babylon, but never saw Babylon because he was blinded before he ever went there. The Word of God is an amazing thing. I wouldn't bet my dollar that I'll pay, if the Lord tarries, for a cup of French roast coffee at Diva tomorrow morning against it, because I'll be out a cup of coffee. 
You don't bet against the Word of God. I mean, it's just beautiful how, you know, God puts it forth and it's, it's just going to happen the way that He said, even though Zedekiah rejected it because it seemed as if uh, it was contradictory. And then in verse 6, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me while he's in this captured condition, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you. So Hanamiel is, is Jeremiah's cousin. He's going to come to you, saying, By my field, which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So here he is. He's imprisoned here in this courtyard of the king. And he gets what is essentially a word of knowledge from God. Uh, the word of knowledge is a spiritual gift that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it is when God reveals to someone by his Holy Spirit a fact that they could not otherwise know except that God revealed that fact to them. So here he is just minding his own business. He receives a word from the Lord that Hanamiel, his cousin, is going to come and offer Jeremiah the opportunity to buy his land in Anathoth. And here's the, that's what he receives. Now, it's an interesting thing, because under the Jewish law, when you were about to sell your land, in other words, you needed to sell your land because you needed money for that land uh, for some reason, the first person you would go to to sell your land before you would sell it to anyone outside of the family is you would go to the blood relative that was the closest relationship to you and offer him the land to buy so that the land would stay in the family. Land was power. Land is power today. And so the land would stay in the power in, in, in the hands of the family so that one or two families wouldn't end up with all of the land. God wanted to be careful about that. And so here he comes, Hanamiel, and he offers to Jeremiah, you're my nearest blood relative, I offer you my land to buy my land. Now, there's a problem with this, because the land is in Anathoth. And Anathoth was the hometown of Jeremiah. Everyone hated him in Anathoth. They tried to kill him in Anathoth. But there's a bigger problem than that. I mean, you wouldn't want to buy land where everyone hates you. I mean, that, that's the least of the problems now. Anathoth is already in Babylonian hands. It's already been captured. Uh, you talk about a bad real estate market. It was a bad real estate market at that point. That land was valueless. It was like, here comes this world-ruling empire, comes in, takes over Anathoth, looks like their kingdom is going to go on forever and ever. They control all of the land. That land is valueless. It's good for nothing. And here comes my cousin trying to get money out of me, trying to sell me land that he knows is good for nothing too. So the Lord gives him a word of knowledge, Hanamiel's coming. You think he's saying, no, he's going to come and he's going to try and rip you off and don't go for it. But that's not what God is doing because he's, he's going to talk about the restoration of the people of the land. And then God said, uh, and, and then we're told in verse 8, Then Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord. And he said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, which, by the way, is taken over by the Babylonians. But he didn't say that. But Jeremiah knew, For the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption yours, Buy it for yourself. And then Jeremiah says, Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And this is very fascinating to me. He knew it was the word of the Lord speaking to him when? When it happened. When it happened. Now, how is he getting all of these prophecies from God? And he knows they're from God. And yet this one happens and he's kind of in the dark until it's fulfilled. And then he knows for sure it's happened. It's interesting that prophecy is also a spiritual gift given by God. It means to speak forth for God. And I'm convinced that in the ministry of Jeremiah with the other prophets, that when God gave him the gift of prophecy to declare a prophecy for him, that God also coupled with that gift of prophecy another spiritual gift called the gift of faith. The gift of faith. The faith now, a supernatural gift by God's Holy Spirit to know that this is the Word of God and then to declare the Word of God. But here's a case where God spoke to him and it wasn't clear to him until it had happened. Now, this is um, may not be encouraging to anybody else, but this is very encouraging to me. You ever have something where you feel like 
you have this strong, strong impression by the Lord in a certain direction or about a certain thing. You don't really know. You know, I mean, it could, well, I don't know. I don't want to take a stand on this kind of a thing. Sometimes God will tell us something or give you a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy or a word of wisdom, couples that gift of faith with it, and it's just like, you know that you know that you know that you know this is it. No questions. And then other times, he gives it to you, and it's kind of like, well, gosh, Lord, I, I, I don't know. And, it, and it's refreshing to me that Jeremiah, who was so completely tuned into the Lord, had to deal with that a, a little bit, too. One of the things that's interesting in when we will have uh, afterglows or just times of waiting on the Lord here in the fellowship, one of the great things that happens while people, all of us, are growing in our spiritual gifts because God can give you a prophecy or he can give you a verse or he can give you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. It's all tested by the word of God. It never is elevated above the word of God. But sometimes God can give you a verse and you feel like you're supposed to share it. Oh, gosh, Lord, I'm supposed to share it. Well, what am I wrong? <laughs> you know, and we all have a little self-consciousness about that. And uh, the Bible's pretty serious about being wrong on, on things like this. You say, gosh, Lord, I don't know if it's re- if I'm supposed to and, and all of that kind of thing. And so you sit on the verse and you sit on the verse and somebody's whole future is depending upon whether that verse gets shared. And there you're sitting out playing safe and, and all of that. And God knows full well that Right now, you're not comfortable yet with spiritual gifts in terms of stepping out like that. And so what does he do? He nudges someone across the room and they share the verse. Yeah, I heard, you know. And you go up to the person after and say, yeah, God gave that to me before he gave it to you. And I just (laughs) sitting on it a little bit, you know, and no, you don't really do that. But I mean, there's that deal where God will then speak through someone else. And then you then you you realize that was the Lord speaking to me. And you get a, a sense for what that kind of is like a little bit. And then the longer we walk with the Lord, the more comfortable we come with those things and, oh, and uh, available to the Lord to use us in, in that kind of a way. So when this happened, then he knew that it was the word of the Lord. And so what did he do? He obeyed God. I bought the field from Hanamiel, the son of my uncle who was in Anathoth. I weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver, and I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, weighed the money and the balances. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open, and I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, which was kind of his secretary, in the presence of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed, before all of the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. So he bought the land, and he signed the deeds, had all of the witnesses. That land is now his. And then I charged, verse 13, Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this purchase deed which is sealed, and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. And so he buys buys the land, takes those uh, two scrolls, and they're put in an earthen vessel, which was the way uh, that was long term storage of that day. Seal up the vessel. And God knew it was going to be a while before they would break into those deeds. And God was telling Jeremiah, listen, that land is worth nothing right now. But. I'm going to bring my people back to this land, and it's going to be worth a lot then. And so he had Jeremiah buy the land. What God is doing is is interesting here, because what he's having Jeremiah do is to live in accordance with what he was preaching. To live in accordance with what he was preaching. It was one thing, and an easy thing, to preach that God was going to restore the Jews back into the land. Jeremiah, I want you to... Give a prophecy and declare that I'm going to bring my people back into this land. They're going to fill the land. There's going to be sheep in the land. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. All right, you know, Lord, I'll deliver that. And you deliver that message. And and then it's another thing when God comes along and says, oh, by the way, I want you to buy some land. There's another thing when he says, all right, I want you to spend your money like what you're preaching is true. And what you're saying is true. And, and now, <laughs> it's kind of, a, we have a crass way of putting it, and that is, 
to, to put our money where our mouth is. And that's what God was asking Jeremiah to do. Jeremiah, you're delivering a message that they're going to come back. What will it look like if you won't have anything to do with Hananiel's land? It's going to look like you're saying one thing and living another way, and that's not going to represent me well. I want you to say this, and then I want you to live like that word is true. I want there to be a consistency between your life and the message. And and that's what he's calling Jeremiah to do, and of course that's what he calls us to do. It's a day two. And, uh, and sometimes he comes along and he has his ways of doing that in our life to do it today too, doesn't he? In terms of our priorities and says, listen, I've been listening to you teach that for a while and some different things and now I want you to invest this in it. Hey, whoa, hey, wait a second. That's my retirement. <laughs> I mean, I like sharing about the end times and all, but I mean, I like to have a little kitty over here too. I mean, so, I mean however he does, nothing wrong with retirement or, or, or any of that, but I mean, the Lord has his ways of saying, now let's live consistent with the message. That we're talking about here. That's what he's calling Jeremiah to do. Well, Jeremiah, he's not understanding all of this. And uh, so we t- find in verse 16, Now, when I had delivered the purchase deed to Baruch, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And it's a beautiful way to start a prayer. And Jeremiah talking about who the Lord is, and talks about what He's done. You've created the heavens and the earth. There's nothing too hard for you, Lord. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, you are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all of the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day and in Israel and among other men, and you have made yourself a name as it is this day, and you have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror. You have given them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and took possession of it. But they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. And therefore you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. Look at the siege mounds. They've come to the city to take it. And the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword and famine and pestilence. What you have spoken has happened. There you see it. Now, this is a beautiful prayer of Jeremiah. And one of the great things about this prayer is it is characteristic of almost all of the prayers of the Bible. And one of the interesting things in a study of the prayers of the Bible is that in those prayers, the men and the women who prayed them, the overwhelming majority of the prayer was about how great God was, how big He was, what He had done in creation, what we see every day of Your hands, Lord, as Your handiwork, and then what You've done in the lives of Your people through history, and what You've done in my life. And I mean, as soon as they end up lifting up their praise and thanksgiving and worship to God, in, in light of who he is, it's interesting that as you study the prayers, the request almost becomes an add-on. It becomes an addendum. Oh, by the way, I've got this big need in my life. And it becomes an addendum because it's, it's now in the context of who it is that we're praying to. So this beautiful prayer that he's lifting up to the Lord, and then now he gets to his problem in verse 25, and he said, all of these things about you, Lord, and you have said to me, O Lord God, buy the field for money and take witnesses, yet the city has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans. And so basically what Jeremiah is saying to the Lord is, Lord, I I know how great you are. I know how awesome you are. I know how wise you are. But I'm not getting this. I'm not getting this. This This is not a market to be buying real estate in. It's a very depressed market. This is the time to be unloading real estate. Lord, you should have perhaps told me who I could go to unload my real estate to. 
instead of bringing someone to unload theirs on me. And he's, he's really perplexed when God calls him to close this uh, real estate transaction. And, and he's uh, rightly perplexed because it's, it's completely, completely illogical. God has him buying something that is valueless for the moment. But God doesn't lead us uh, with only the, the moment in, in mind. He looks far beyond the moment in, in his leading of us. And he can call us to do things that will not make sense to anyone but him. And that includes you. And includes me. doesn't make any sense at the moment. And yet God is setting things in place for the future that he knows is coming. It's not always going to make sense when the finite is dealing with the infinite. Well, the Lord has an answer for Jeremiah. God listens to prayer. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now, Jeremiah began his prayer with that. And then he kind of went through his prayer. And then he ended his prayer. And he's kind of saying to God, this looks a little hard for you. God says, now let me remind you of how you started the prayer. So you were saying how nothing was too difficult for me. I want to remind you of that. And nothing is too difficult for me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against this city shall come and set fire to this city and burn it with the houses on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with the work of their hands, says the Lord. For this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all of the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned to me the back and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and listening and teaching them, yet they have not instru- uh, listened to receive instruction. Have you ever uh, been talking to someone about the deepest thing in your heart and had that person turn their back and begin to talk with someone else. Probably not very many of us have had that happen because that's like so uncouth. <laughs> I mean, that's so Ill, ill-mannered ill where someone would be sharing the deepest things of their life and then all of a sudden they turn and start talking to someone else while you're in mid-sentence and one moment you were talking to their face and the next moment now you're talking to their back. And yet that's how God saw uh the nation of Israel in dealing with him. He was sharing the most important things of his heart to them, the things that were important to him. And while he's in mid-sentence sharing these things through his prophets, they turn their back on him to talk to other gods, to false gods. And that's how he he uh, viewed this. And, and it, what, you know, one of the things that really speaks that, uh, to me, and it ex- exhorts my heart in, in verse 33 is, how precious do I re- do I really consider uh, God's voice? How precious? So, yeah, 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 Lord, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, and I'm capable of that. But how precious is His voice to me uh, when He's talking? Is always very important. But they set their abominations in the house which is called by My name to defile it, and they built the high places of Baal which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their daughters, sons and daughters, to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in my great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and will cause them to dwell safely. God said, I'm going to work in their life. 
It doesn't look like they're ever going to turn, but they're going to turn. I'm going to win in their life. And they're going to come back into this land because I'm bringing them back into the land, Jeremiah. That's why I wanted you to buy the land as a demonstration of the truthfulness of my prophecy before these people. And then they shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will bring on them all the good that I have promised them. And fields will be bought in this land, of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, and the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, and the cities of the south, and I will cause their captives to return says the Lord. And so the Lord was saying, one day this land is going to be valuable again. I'm going to bring them back. And uh, I wanted your life to be consistent before them, uh, Jeremiah, with the prophecies. I wanted you to speak for me, but I also wanted you to live for me before these people. Chapter 33, God continues his message of restoration He said, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying, thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. Speaking of the heavens and the earth that Jeremiah had had prayed about earlier, the Lord is his name. And then God says something beautiful to Jeremiah, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And that's God's giving him a promise to a promise to prayers <laughs> to people who pray. He says, call on me, call on me, and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things. When he talks about mighty things, it literally means hidden things, the things that only he knows. And there's certain things that he reveals uh, out of answer to prayer. And so he's calling Jeremiah to continued prayer because he wants to continue to reveal uh, himself to Jeremiah and through Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, which have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mounds and the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men whom I will slay in my anger and my fury for all whose wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. And so God is declaring that the day is coming when Jerusalem is going to be taken by the Babylonians, that his people are going to needlessly die because they would not turn from their wickedness to him. In verse 6, Behold, I will bring it health and healing. Now the future restoration of the people in the land. He's going to bring health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of of peace and truth. And so when the day would come among his people, when health and healing and peace and truth were more important to them than sin and wickedness, God said, I'm going to bring them back into the land and I'm going to give them these things. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and will rebuild these places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. And so God says, when the captivity has cleansed them of their iniquity, I'm going to bring them back into the land. And that's precisely what God did. Then in verse 9, he said, then it shall be to me, speaking of Jerusalem and the land, he said, then when I bring them back cleansed and they've made a choice to follow me rather than sin, He said, then the land and Jerusalem will be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth, 
who shall hear all the good that I do to them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I provide for it. God said, when they come back into the land, and these things are once again important to them, purity and righteousness and peace and the prosperity that comes with obedience, he said, I'll prosper the land, and the land will once again become a blessing to God. It'll be a blessing to God's people, but it'll also be a blessing to the surrounding nations as they watch God bless his people and glorify him for it. And thus says the Lord, again there shall be heard in this place, of which you say it is desolate without man and without beast, and the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, and the voice of those who will say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And so God is saying, you know, I can see it. I know I'm going to bring the people back and this land is going to be filled with joy-filled people and filled with joy concerning me. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place which is desolate without man and without beast and in all its cities, there shall again be a habitation of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. And so not only people coming back, but there'll be flocks in the field once again. And in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, the flock shall again pass under the hands of him who counts them, says the Lord. And so the picture is, as the shepherd would count his flock at the end of the day, coming in, he'd put his rod out or his hand out, and he'd count them, one, two, three, four. So he'd know the whole group came in, and he'd know, oop, I own a hundred. And I got ninety-nine here, got one out in the field out there. And so they, they would count the sheep in this way. And so he said that all of that is going to return once again uh, to the land. You know, isn't it funny how... Um, Sometimes it's not till you, you lose the simple joys in life that you really appreciate uh, the simple joys in, in life. And, and, uh, uh, I was, I was reading, um, uh, where they, you know, they took the bounty off of the head of, uh, Salman Rushdie here recently. And I was reading an article somewhere as it relates to him, but he was talking about the fact that uh, one of the things he missed was just walking out of his house and taking a walk. And he couldn't do that. Uh, every day, I, I can walk out my front door and take a walk. And, and sometimes we can look at ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm only making this much a year. But yeah, you, but you can walk out your front door and take a walk. You don't have a bounty on your head. And, and you don't have to rent an amusement park in order that people won't mob you for your autograph. I mean, there are perks with, with being, you know, average people like we are. And, and sometimes it's not to you have, lost what those simple little things you realize how great they were and, and once again they would appreciate uh, those things. Verse 14 Behold the days are coming says the Lord that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And now he heads into a future prophecy even yet future for us. In those days and at that time I will cause to grow up to David speaking of uh, the Messiah coming out of the lineage of David a branch of righteousness, and he will execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And so when we were in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, he used the same language describing the Messiah who was to come, uh, the Lord Jesus, and the thousand-year reign that Jesus is going to establish after the great tribulation, and it will be a reign of righteousness. No unrighteousness will be accepted or allowed in any way during uh, during his reign. And so he's going to come, establish a kingdom of righteousness. He's a branch of righteousness. He will execute judgment and righteousness in the earth, speaking of that kingdom age. And you, you find yourself uh, crying out with uh, tremendous ease, uh, Lord, come quickly these days. And this world is in such chaos. I, 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 feel, um, I, I feel for the people of the Soviet Union. They're heading into another winter. I mean, winter is, is there for them. It gets cold much quicker and that whole thing. And, and here it is, just pure chaos again. And 
and madness and all of this, trying to scrape up some cabbage and some bread and the whole... I mean, Lord, come quickly uh, and establish your righteous reign and, you know, so that all of the world can, can be blessed and things can be right. And, and uh, we long for that, that return of the Lord. And then in verse 16, in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this will be the name by which Jerusalem will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Jerusalem is going to dwell in perfect safety because Jesus is going to reign there during that millennial reign, that kingdom age reign. Now, in verse 16, the Lord, our righteousness, that was a title that the Holy Spirit gave to the Messiah in chapter 23. Now he gives the same title to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is one day going to take on the very characteristics of the Messiah, the very characteristics of the Lord Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. And that's going to be the characteristic of Jesus' rule, complete and perfect right onness and the eyes of the Lord. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And so the Lord, as he takes that place of the lineage of David, no lack of a man to sit upon that throne. Now, it's interesting that Zedekiah, when his eyes were put out, he was taken uh, captive. And all of a sudden, the throne of David, it ceased in, in 586 B.C. But God never promised an unbroken monarchy. What he promised was that the series of kings, there would be an unbroken line of descendants of David. And so that series of kings was broken and it's going to be reintroduced again with another from the lineage of David, the Lord Jesus himself. Verse 18, speaking of this kingdom age, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offering before me, to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice uh, continually. Now, one of the things that's interesting when we get into the book of Ezekiel is that in Ezekiel, it's talking there uh, about uh, the new temple that is going to be uh, built uh, during that kingdom age and for that kingdom age. And one of the interesting things is that there'll be sacrifices. There'll be sacrifices. He speaks of the same sacrifices here. He talks about uh, uh, priests. He talks about Levites. He talks about burnt offerings. He talks about rain offerings. And that creates some confusion sometimes because we look at it and we say, wait a second. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those sacrifices and all of those offerings. Why, when he comes in his fullness and establishes his kingdom, are these sacrifices going to be offered once again? Well, let's take note for a moment of what sacrifice will not be offered. The sacrifices that will be offered is the burnt offering, which is a, was an offering of consecration, and the grain offering, which was an offering that represented fellowship with God. There's no mention of a sin offering being offered. And it appears what happens is that God is going to allow the sacrifices to occur at that time because just as those sacrifices were a foreshadowing of Jesus and spoke of him and were typical of him, so too during the kingdom age, they'll speak with the same force to the Jewish people. Now, here is Jesus before them. He's ruling over them during the kingdom age. And now they're going to see face to face how he was a fulfillment of all of those sacrifices that they rejected him over. And so these sacrifices will become a memorial, much like communion is a memorial for us as a time to remember uh, who he was and how the volume of the book had testified uh, of him. And so um, interesting as it relates to uh, some of these workings of, of the thousand year reign. And the word of the Lord, verse 18, came to Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant on his throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, speaking of the stars, nor the sand of the sea be measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not considered 
what these people have spoken, speaking of the Babylonians. The two families which the Lord has chosen, he's cast them off, speaking of Israel and Judah. And the Babylonians and the surrounding nations were kind of mocking uh, Israel in their chastisement at the hands of the Lord. And, and they were saying, you know, here are these chosen of the Lord, and now God has cast them off. Um, it is never a good idea uh, to make fun of or to pile on when God is disciplining his children. It never means he's through with his children. It means even something greater is coming from their life. And to pile on in that kind of a situation is always to underestimate the grace of God for his people. God has firm ways of dealing with us as his people. He has very firm ways of dealing with us. Very interesting and personal ways that he has of dealing with us. But he's never through with his people. And so they were mocking and they were saying, well, God is through with this Israel. He's through with Judah. He's through with them. God is through with the Jews. That kind of thing. And God said, thus they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant is not with day and with night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captives to be to return, and I will have mercy on them. God was saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you are able to stop the sun from rising tomorrow or stop it from setting tomorrow, then this covenant would be broken. But man can't stop that covenant that God has with his creation, uh, the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars. And God said, that covenant with my creation is never going to be broken and I'm not through with my people. This is a very big deal. It's a very big deal. You think, well, okay, it's, he's dealing with the Jews. He's got a future for the Jews and all. But the interesting thing is, is how uh, uh, alarmingly quickly in the body of Christ today, the Jews are being moved out of the way and out of the prophetic picture in some interpretations of the scriptures, incorrect interpretation, but it's happening. And many, many places, they take all of the promises that have to do with the Jews they remove the Jews from that context and they insert the church. And then what you end up with is a confusing mix. Now you've got two entirely different groups now, misidentified and all mixed up, and you'll never make sense of the prophetic picture if we do that. God has a plan for the Jews that is present tense and it is future. He has a plan for his church that is present tense and for the future, he does not have a different way for the Jews to be saved and for the Gentiles to be saved. Everyone gets saved the same way, but he has a different plan for both groups in the end times. And so you don't want to mix these things up where you say, yeah, God is through with the Jews and now all those promises are for the church. No, God spoke to Daniel and he said, 77s are determined upon your people. Who were his people? The Jews. And 69 of those sevens were fulfilled between the time the king Artaxerxes gave the decree to Nehemiah to rebuild the wall of the city of Jerusalem. And then he said, one more seven, the 70th seven is determined upon the Jews. And it's the, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the great tribulation that is coming. God is still working among these people. They have an identity. God is, has a plan. Uh, for them as a group that is unique to them in all of the world. Not in terms of salvation, but in terms of the end times uh, scenario. So be careful that doesn't get mixed up. Otherwise, I mean, you can take Isaiah, you can take Zechariah, you can take First and Second Thessalonians, um, you can take Revelation and just throw them out in terms of trying to understand them if, if you mix these two groups up. Uh, chapter 34. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army 
all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem and all its cities, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Zedekiah, escape is... uh, I mean, there's just no chance of escape here. The defeat is coming. And you shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand. Your eyes shall see the eyes of the king of Babylon. He shall speak with you face to face, and you shall go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, You shall not die by the sword, but you shall die in peace, as in the ceremonies of your fathers, the former kings who were before you. So they shall burn incense for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have pronounced uh, the word, says the Lord. And so God spoke to uh, to Zedekiah, you're going to go into captivity, but you're not going to be killed by the Babylonians. And Zedekiah was kept by the Babylonians. And when he died, the Jewish people grieved over him, as was typical for them to grieve over the death of, of their king. And then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem, when the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah were that were left against Lachish and Azekah, for only these fortified cities remained of the cities uh, of Judah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all of the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them that every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should uh, should set free his male and female servants, that no one should keep them in bondage anymore, they obeyed and let them go. Now there was a, a, a provision uh, 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 by God under the law of Moses, where let's say uh, Tim uh, was my physical, uh, let's say uh, Tim here in the front row over here, and I'll teach him for sitting there. But let's say he's a Hebrew and I'm a Hebrew, and I hit some financial problems, um, and. I come to him and I say, Tim, I need some money to get out from under the debt that I'm in. I want to sell myself as a servant to you uh, for a certain sum of money in order that I might pay my debts off. I was free to become his servant, and he was free under the law to make me his servant. But the provision of the law was that I could only be his servant for six years. And the seventh year... Every Hebrew slave was to be released. No Hebrew was ever to be a servant to another Hebrew for longer than six years. But the children of Israel, as was the case with so many of the commands, when they weren't convenient, they simply disobeyed them. And they were holding on to these servants long past the six years and keeping them in bondage. Now, something hits King Zedekiah where he speaks to the princes and the leaders of the people, and he says, we ought to let these people go. Uh, They've been in bondage longer than the period of time. Let's obey the word of God, and let's, let's let the people go. And they let the servants go. Now, we don't know why they did it. We don't know why. We do know that it wasn't a high motivation because of what comes next. But... Maybe it was because they needed every single person they could on the wall fighting against the Chaldeans. So they said, let's free up the servants. It might have been that because food had become so scarce that it was easier just to free up the slaves so that they could fend for themselves in order to try and keep themselves alive rather than the, the master uh, trying to, to, to provide for them. It might have been that in some wild moment, uh, they got a 
temporary concern for the Word of God and, and what the Word had to say. We don't know what happened, but something happened. And lo and behold, a glimmer of hope, they obeyed the Word of God. <laughs> You know, I mean, those of you who have been with us from the beginning, I mean, it's like the little poppers where, you know, for the delight and the streamers go out. I mean, it was like, this is a bit, I mean, here they are, they've done something, they've repented, which is the whole theme of the book. So they, they've, they've repented here. And it's exciting. But they changed their mind in verse 11. <laughs> it's always a bummer. You know, it's tough, very tough being God with people. Yes. But afterwards, they changed their minds and they made the male and female servants return. Now, imagine what that did to the servants. Whom they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female servants. Now, later in uh, in chapter 37, we get a glimpse at probably what happened here. And what happened probably is that they released the servants to fight on the walls against the Babylonians. And right about this time... The Egyptians came up from the south with their army against the Babylonians' rear. And when Nebuchadnezzar realized that the Egyptians had come against him on the rear, he pulled his forces back and he defeated the Egyptian army, took care of them. Well, here they are inside and it looks like Nebuchadnezzar's retreating. And it looks like he might get whipped by the Egyptians in spite of about 175 prophecies that God had given that this wasn't going to happen. And so now it looks like, all right, we're back to normal. We're not under the crunch that we were under, you know, the crisis that we were under. And so give me my slave back. I mean, the, the flesh is ugly, isn't it? You know, I mean, you, saw, you did something right, and then now just going to just do something ugly right right after. And they took those slaves right back. I and, and so this tells us that that what they did with their slaves was not out of a genuine concern uh, for obeying the Lord, because that would have withstood any change in the circumstances. The fact that they took them back is they just kind of did it because they were in a pinch. And as soon as they got out of the pinch, they went right back to the old way. And I, I know that never happens today in the 20th century, but uh, but it did happen back then. And so they took these slaves back. And, and God was watching all of it. And, and it's hard when you've been talking for 40 years to a group of people to repent. And they finally repent. And then they repent of their repentance. And, and so that's kind of what happened here. And therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from uh, the Lord saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. But your fathers did not obey me nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight. <laughs> I like that. He said, recently, uh, we saw a nice trend there in, in Jerusalem. The reason you turned and you did what was right in my sight. Every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Then you turned around and profaned my name. And every one of you brought back his male and female slaves, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you. He said, you proclaimed a, a phony, nonsensical liberty to these slaves. He said, I proclaim a liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. 
I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat for the birds of heaven and the beasts of the earth. And I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which has gone back from you. Behold, I will command, says the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. So here he's giving us the context of what, where they turn back. And they will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Now, when he talks about this calf, uh, they had passed between the two halves of the calf. In that day, uh, when men would make a, a covenant with one another, and sometimes when they would make a covenant with God, and God even when he made a covenant with Abraham, uh, Abram, the, the, what they would do is they would take an animal, and they would sacrifice the animal by, by cutting it in half and putting one half on one side and the other half on the other side. And then the two parties that were making the covenant, they would pass between the sacrifice together. And that was a like the highest vow that you could make, that you were going to keep your word to what you had said that you would do. And the leaders of Jerusalem had gone through this very large uh, religious uh, exercise uh, to uh, put a stamp of you know soberness upon the commitment that they were making to God to obey Him as it related to His law concerning uh, the Hebrew slaves. And then God is speaking to them and saying, "And the first chance you you got to break it, uh, you broke it." And but He said He's saying, "I noticed what you said, and then I noticed what you did." And, and then he spoke of the judgment that was going to come upon them. Why? Because the only thing that was going to turn judgment away from them was repentance from their wickedness. And even to this point, they're unwilling to repent.